It's really good to be here and uh, appreciate the invitation and um, it's, it's just a lot of fun. I have a question. Um, how many of you do any sort of counseling? Uh, whether it's formal, informal, you know, people come to you, they want to talk. Just about every one of us probably has somebody that comes to us and we talk. Um, when you have a conversation and you sit down with a friend, say a conversation that lasts, say, you know, 15, 20 minutes at least, when you sit down and you look back at your conversation, does it seem to follow a, pro, a, a pattern where you can like look at it and say, oh, I think I'm going to go and outline that. So we talk about this point, and then we hit this point, sub point, and this sub point, and then we hit this one, and we it, does it look like that, or is it like mine, where it's like, it's, it's kind of all over the place. One thing just kind of follows, it's more of a snake than anything else. And one thing follows another. And if you ever looked up about halfway through and said, now how do we get on that topic? Yeah. <laughs> so that happens, right? Well, that's normal conversation. And the reason it goes like, goes like that is because we don't think about, when we sit around and have conversations, we don't tend to sit around beforehand and make an outline. I mean, that's not conversation between friends. We don't have outlines. Um, another question, when you're count, doing some counseling, sometimes you're talking to this person and you're asking them questions, um, they, and they're telling you stories, they're telling things that are happening, but they seem to come back around, they, came to, they seem to hit certain points again and again. Um, maybe it's a topic, maybe it's a trauma in their life, maybe something that's happened, and they just keep, er, er, you ask them a question, and, and it circles back around. And you ask them another question, and it circles back around. And it keeps hitting that same point. You ever had that happen? Yes? Yeah. Okay, good. I see everybody's shaking their head, but I don't hear anything. So I'm very interactive. I'm sorry if that's a... <laughs> um, well, the re one of the things that, um, that I noticed when I first got to Papua New Guinea um, is that the people in Papua New Guinea think very differently than we do. It's not just the language that is different. It's the ideas behind the language. In fact, their trade language um, is an uh, English-based uh, pidgin, and they only have about 2,000 words in the language. But it's how they put them together that they get their ideas across. And one word can have several different meanings. One word can have several different usages, really. Um, also... When you talk to them, sometimes things seem a little bit, um, I don't know, you might say all over the place. I remember one time when I, when I first, uh, first, this first happened, I got to Papua New Guinea, I'd been there for a few weeks, and um, we had uh, some mentors that were taking us under their wing and trying to help show us the ropes, you might say. And so my wife, we had two young children, so she wasn't able to go this morning. And so just me and this older lady, she was about, she and her husband were about ready to retire. We went to a church in the community. And I didn't know the trade language then, so I didn't understand a single word that he said. But I looked around and I watched the people, and they were getting it. How did I know they were getting it? Well, they were very cultural. You probably remember that one, right? And when they hear something they agree with, and if they hear something they really agree with, it's aye. And so this guy was talking, and everybody was just aye. And they were just going all the time, and they were really understanding it. And when he got done, people, it was, you could tell the emotional impact that this had on these people. And, and um, people were sitting around at the end, some men over here, they, do, they divide it up where men are on one side, ladies on the other. And some men were sitting over here, and, and they were praying with other men, and some ladies were sitting over here, and, and they were crying with other ladies. And it was like, wow, I, I don't know what he said, but man, was it impactful. And so uh, uh, me and this uh, lady, we walked home. She'd been in the country for 20, 25 years at least. And, uh, and she said, well, what do you think about the service? I said, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I didn't understand much, but wow, it looked like they got it. He, and she said, you know what he said? It was really good, but he, he just, it was so frustrating because I wish he'd just say what he means. And it was like, I didn't understand what she meant by that. What do you mean, just say what you mean? 
um, the idea that she was getting across was this whole idea of linear versus global thinking. We think linearly. All right, and so linear thinking, if we want to say, you've heard the, heard the old adage, right? You know, if, if you want to show that A equals D, then you say, well, A equals B, right? And then what's next? Well, B equals C, and then what's the next one? C equals D, therefore, A equals D, right? Yes, understood? That's very simple, correct? You understand that, not a problem. Um, if you're a pastor or you speak much, then you probably start out just like this. Your, 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 your outline is going to look like this, right? You're going to tell them what, you, uh, what you're going to say, then you tell them what you're going to say, and then you tell them what you told them, right? So you're going to tell them that A equals D, then you show them how A equals D, and then you tell them that A equals D. <laughs> and hopefully they get it. That's linear thinking. It's a nice straight line, and people follow that. But in not everybody thinks that way. And not people from other countries often don't think that way. In Papua New Guinea, it would be very different. Um, what would happen is the guy would get up and he'd say, well, B equals C. And it would be, okay. And then he'd show that, well, D equals B. All right, well, I, I've got that. And, and then he'd say, A equals C. Oh, now people are starting to get it. Uh huh. And, and then you'd hear the, and they're over there, they're putting it together. And we're sitting here going, really? <laughs> and, and then he finally hit his last point where C equals Z, and ah, uh, everybody's got it. And you and I were just confused because the entire time he never ever states his main point. This main point is figured out by the listener. And that main point is sitting there in the middle, but nobody here, but, but he never states it. <clears throat> That's global thinking. You're hitting all around what you're trying to say, but you never state the main idea. And that's how global thinking works. That's why when you talk to somebody and you're counseling them, they might spin back around and they keep hitting this topic over and over. We like nice linear thought, especially when we come, when we approach the Bible. Right? When we approach the Bible, oh, we love Paul. We love Paul because, man, I mean, he follows the outline. It's like he must have sat there before he ever started dictating or writing the letter. He must have sat there and he had himself a nice Greek thought outline, you know, and he had the main points down and the sub points down and, and he hit everything. It just went right down the row, right down the line. And we understand that, right? <clears throat> then we come to somebody like John. <laughs> Have you ever done a study on 1 John? Anybody ever done a study? 1 John is fun. I, did, I spent the entire last year um, going on Wednesday night uh, teaching through 1 John in a classroom setting. And the thing about 1 John is he doesn't do linear thinking. In fact, what is fun to do is get yourself a whole bunch of commentaries or a Bible program that has a bunch of commentaries and start looking up how they try to make an outline of 1 John. It's hilarious. It is absolutely hilarious because nobody knows how to get where they're going. In fact, I was just looking at them even earlier this morning, and sometimes they'll say that, you know, oh, he talks about this point, then he hits this point, and then he makes an aside. And then he makes it another side, and then he comes down and hits this point. Or another one, an excursion, um, and a, a divulsion, and, you know, they use all these different terms. Basically, what they're saying is that he's jumping off on bunny trails, you know? They, they think John is just like a scatterbrain, and, he, and he's just going all over the place. But that's not the case. John knows exactly where he's going and what he's doing. He starts out with the first topic, and then hits the second one. And that all, that's all well and good. And then he goes to the third one. Nice. We're following him pretty well. Fourth, oh, good. We're, we're nice right down the line. And then all of a sudden, he turns back and he hits another one. He hits the one that we've already seen before. It's like, well, didn't you finish that the first time? And, and then he goes and he hits another one. Oh, well, this is a new one. Okay, now we're back on track. That first one, that was an aside. You know, he was just kind of off some way. And, and we go to the next one. Good. We got every. Hang on. What's he doing now? Are you kidding? He's going. And now where is he going? And then he keeps going from there and he pops back. It's like, this, my friends, is the outline of 1 John. It's like, it goes all over the place. <clears throat> 
So when you look at 1 John, you can't make an a, point A, point B, point C, and then your nice little subpoints, and it follows a nice line. That's not the way it works. He thinks very globally. And he's trying to get points across, but what he does is he'll hit a point, and then he'll come back and then build on it. And then he'll go to another point, and he'll come back and he'll build on another point. And he keeps building points up. It's like he's putting blocks here. You ever seen somebody doing a stone wall, right? And they put them here. They don't stack them all up. That would be pretty difficult, especially if you're trying to stagger them and you're sticking them in the side. So you put them down, and sometimes the wall goes up over here, and then he comes back, and the wall builds. And when you're done, you have a good wall, but it wasn't built in a nice ground-up linear fashion. True? Okay, so that's the way a lot of Bible thinkers work. And it's one of the things that um, I have seen. How many of you, <laughs> maybe, maybe I shouldn't ask this, <laughs> how many of you either yourselves or have heard a uh, sermon on the Beatitudes? If you don't raise your hand, then you're not listening to me because everybody who has gone to church has gone has listened. How many of you have preached, maybe I shouldn't ask that, <laughs> on the Beatitudes? The, the thing I remember when, uh, during COVID, um, our, uh, the church shut down and everybody was home. And so the pastor had the idea, hey, we're going to do like this weekly thing where every, every couple of days we're going to put something out on Facebook. And it's kind of like a, just a little devotional. And he said, Kent, I want you to start the Beatitudes. And so I, I t- sat down and I looked at the ba- Beatitudes and... I remember sitting there and uh, talking to my daughter about it because she grew up with me in Papua New Guinea, and so she was with me almost the whole time. And so she still understood this idea of global thinking as well. But most people don't get that. If you look at Jesus, he's speaking to who when he's on the Sermon on the Mount? Where's, where's he at? Well, Mount gives you an idea. Where, okay, so he's on the side of a hill where? Huh? In Galilee, by the Sea of the Galilee. Um, and so he's probably talking to very highly educated people, right? No, no. These are simple people. But he speaks to them in a way where they understand him. I have heard so many messages on the Beatitudes, and it's, it's really kind of fun. I remember here, the, the best two I heard was the pastor started off and he got to about the third one and then it fell apart. Because it's like the first one's here and then the second one follows that one and the third one goes, and I'm not sure how the fourth one goes, but it, kind of working it around. The, the other one, the pastor got to the, he was, he was just so enthralled. It's like, I, I've got this, I understand this, I heard how a guy was talking about this and I finally understand the Sermon on the Mountain. It's like, he goes to the first point and, and the second point. It's like, okay, I see how we kind of got something that follows here. And he gets to the third point, and it's getting a little bit confusing. He goes to the fourth point, and it's like, okay, I see. He goes to the fifth point, and it blew up again. And these were by the same guy. <laughs> it's just, you can't, people try to make the Beatitudes even something that's very linear. And it doesn't work that way. Let me show you how this works. So we have the Beatitudes, and he comes up, and he starts talking to them, and you know how they go, right? He's got, basically what he's doing is he's making a contrast between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of this world. Let me see how, show how you look. So first he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, right? You know that one, right? Yes? Hello? Okay, good, good. Making sure you're still awake. All right, well, you know, the people there, they're poor, so, you, you know, Jesus had them at poor. That they, were, they, were, they understand what poor means. They understand how that works. They understand what life as a poor person looks like. And he, and he says, blessed are the poor. Whoa. Hmm. Well, that's shocking because in the real world, is, are the poor blessed? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven? Poor people don't get anything. They get, they get maybe a few handouts here and there, but they don't get much of anything. And if you look back 2,000 years ago, it was a lot less. They didn't have Social Security. They didn't have Medicaid. They didn't have all these programs for people who were indigent or whatever. You basically lived on your own. 
and you tried to keep alive. And poor people understood that. And they were just told, hang on, the kingdom of heaven belongs to the poor. Is that how the world works? That the kingdom belongs to the poor people? That's not how the world works, is it? True? Yes? No? The world follows something a little bit more like the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. That's, that's more truth, right? Is that how America even works? I mean, we have all these social things, but is that true? The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. That's how it works. And then, Paul, and then Jesus goes on and he talks about something completely different. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so people try and draw a line between that one and the first one, but don't do that. Don't do that. Just look at them each time. Blessed are those who mourn, for they are comforted. The people are, who mourn, you know, you, we're, we're Christians, and we ourselves have just gone through a, a, a very hard time. And, extreme, and we've had people come around us. But if I were to stay in mourning, if all I did was go on Sunday morning and sit in a chair and sniffle, how long do you think I would have people all around me? They'd be kind of like, you know, we're going to kind of steer away from that person. Who's the life of the party? The guy who stands over there in the corner with a tear running down his eye? Or, or, the, or the girl over here who's just throwing her, you know, just being the life of the party, talking to it, right? Why? Because in this world, the mourn are not blessed. They don't get comforted. Not really. No. Instead, laugh and the world laughs with you. Cry. And you cry alone. <clears throat> the world works very differently than what Jesus is telling them. Jesus is telling them, what? Blessed are the poor. They receive the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's not how this world works. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Really? Not where I live. Oh, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Oh, I can relate to that one, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> the meek? The guy who is kind and, and lets you cut in line. How many of you are, are that driver? I know, nobody here because I'm not. <laughs> you let everybody in front of you. Why do you not do that? Because you'll never get anywhere. Because somebody will always get in front of you. Understand why truckers get so irritated. They, they're trying to keep a little distance between the car in front of them so they don't squash it if they, uh, if they have to hit their brakes. And yet, every time they do, somebody's pulling right in in front of them. True? Yeah. And it takes them forever to get through town because they're trying not to squash somebody. <laughs> the meek shall inherit the earth. The nice guys. The good guys. Anybody here watch, fat, uh, watch NASCAR? Hmm? Yeah, some people do. Some people don't want to admit it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those. I'm not sure if I want to admit it. The guy who, lets, uh, who gets passed all the time and lets somebody in. The guy who's, you know, oh, he, he, he gives them a little bit of space this time. Yeah, well, that works for, you know, part of the race. But when it gets down to the end, stage three, that ain't happening, is it? Yeah. Nobody's giving anybody any room. Why? Because nice guys, they don't win the race. Nice guys finish last. True? That's the world. We look at the next one. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Okay, they understood it right there. That's all they needed to hear, hunger and thirst. They know what real hunger is. Okay? Some of us very seldom hit real hunger. Uh, maybe we didn't eat very, uh, very recently. And so, well, we're feeling hungry now. But, yeah. Yeah, we're not all that skinny. We're not, you know, wasting away. They know what real hunger is. They know what real hunger is. Because when you're really hungry, you are working to try and find food. I am told when people are thirsty, when they are literally getting to the point where they're dying of thirst, they will drink anything. You give them a glass of gasoline and they will drink it because they are thirsting. 
They are thirsting. They are desirous of some sort of drink. People out on the ocean, they see the water and they say, I'm, I'm, just, I'm dying of thirst. I've got to drink. And it raises the salinity in their body and it kills them because they'll drink the salt water. When somebody's truly dying of thirst, they are searching for something. What do people search for in this world? Righteousness? Not really. If you're a child of the 80s, you know what the people were searching for back then, rampant materialism. Yeah, it's still here now, but anybody ever heard the uh, phrase, um, whoever has the most toys wins? Yeah, mm-hmm, yeah, materialism, right? Well, then it, that was back in like around the 80s and 90s. You move ahead a little bit uh, forward a little bit, and they actually did a survey, and people had kind of, the idea of being rich had kind of lost its luster, there are too many books had come out where people were rich saying, this, this is empty. It doesn't, it doesn't fulfill you. And so, you know what became the number one desire of people, of young people in particular? It wasn't to be rich. It was to be famous. Hmm. Can you say Kardashians? Famous for what? Doing nothing. <laughs> They're just famous. And that's what people wanted. And what is it now? What are people looking for now? They want to be social influencers right? They want likes and follows. So whoever gets the most likes, whoever gets the most clicks, whoever gets the most traffic, they're the ones who win nowadays. They hunger and they thirst for likes. Hmm. What do we hunger and thirst for? Hang on. Jesus is making it very simple. You've got the kingdom of heaven. That's like this. The kingdom of earth, it, it's not the same. And he goes on. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Is that how it works in this world? Merciful. Constable here, right? He's going to run on the platform of mercy. He's going to say, I am looking for those people who need help, and I'm going to do what I can, and I'm going to work with them against the justice system and try and get them the lightest sentence they can so I can help them. He won't be in office. <laughs> because we want the person who says, justice, bigger punishment. We're going to stamp down this crime. That's what we want to hear, isn't it? True? And yet Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. The world doesn't trust mercy. You find a judge who's giving mercy, and you wonder who's paying him off. Nobody trusts mercy. Instead, the world has adopted a phrase from the Bible, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. We want justice, not mercy. Hmm. Jesus continues. By now, I'll bet everybody in the crowd was going, aye. They were hearing it. They knew what he was saying. We look at it and we still are baffled 2,000 years later. But they understood. Go over to Papua New Guinea and you teach this. They understand. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God, the pure in heart. Now we're working on motives, on motives. Even our motives are in focus, and even our motives in the kingdom of heaven are different. <clears throat> I know that everybody here, I mean, everybody here, of course, we all have pure Motives, right? Pure as a wind-driven snow. No selfishness here. No pride here. We have, I mean, to be part of the ministerial alliance, the first thing you have to do is, is to abolish your pride, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Life doesn't work that way. We're all full of pride. And people are always trying to use their, you, people have all sorts of adverse motives, uh, my wife was trying to look for a job, and she used Indeed. All she got was scammers. Hmm, funny that. Um, and I know that that Nigerian prince that has been emailing you and wants to give you money, 
he's got such pure motives. It's going to happen. It's, it really is. It's going to happen. I mean, take my, no, don't take my word. <laughs> pure motives. The world doesn't have pure motives, does it? No, it's a little different with the world. We know there's no such thing as a free lunch. Somebody says, here, I'll give you something. <laughs> yeah, but what's it going to cost me? True? Hmm. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Who's the peacemaker? Where have all the peacemakers gone? Do peacemakers, are they, are they the ones that everybody's looking to? Think about it this way. Um, okay, we got law enforcement. Hmm. First thing you do when two people are fighting is you put yourself right in between them, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> what's the most, What's the most? as far as statistics go, I believe it still holds true, the most dangerous call for an officer to be called out on is domestic violence. In fact, there are lots of places. I don't know if Granbury Police, I, um, we do it oftentimes because they have uh, more than one car available. <laughs> but if there's... Um, they're required, in a lot of jurisdictions, they're required, to be, when they roll up to a domestic uh, violence, a domestic dispute, they have to park pretty much out of sight, and they wait for backup, and then they both go in together. You never go in alone. In some places, that's absolute procedure. You never go alone because it's dangerous. Because you'll try to stop one person and you'll grab them, you'll grab the guy from hitting her, and what she do? She grabs something and beats you on the back of the head. Yeah. Really? I'm trying to say, how many officers have been shot and even died trying to protect people from each other only to be attacked by those people they're trying to, to protect? Happens all the time. Peacemakers. Everybody had a big outcry when Russia attacked Ukraine. Where were all the peacemakers? <clears throat> yeah, it's still going on. Nine months later, we're st they're still at war. And it's ramping up again. And you're hearing it on the news again, right not. Nobody's stepping up to be a peacemaker. Why? Because peacemakers get punched in the face. Remember uh, Theodore Roosevelt, he had a foreign policy. It was what? Walk softly and carry a big stick. That's the way you work it in the world. You walk softly, but you carry a big stick, and emphasis on the big stick. If you walk softly, not so important. The big sticks, that's what's important. You don't get in between people that are fighting each other. You stand off to the side and point a bigger gun. That's the, and basically, like the rest of the world is doing now, saying, well, don't attack us. And they just watch it go. Hmm. The peacemakers. Wow. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Being persecuted is a good thing? Being persecuted is a good thing? According to this world, is that a true? Do people want to be persecuted? Do they see it as something that's advantageous? No. No. Those who appear weak, they're the ones who get bullied. True? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Those who are persecuted are the ones who get bullied. They, they look weak. Oh, Russia thought Ukraine was weak, and so now they're trying to bully them. Hmm. Works that way in the world, doesn't it? Because in the world, they don't look at it and say, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You don't get anything for being persecuted except bruised, battered, and maybe dead. No. The world says, might makes right. Might makes right. The biggest kid on the playground, he's the one who doesn't get bullied. True? So what's the main idea? Well, the main idea I think I, tell, I mentioned was pretty clear, don't you think? It's not trying to follow linear, that this point goes into this point, that this goes into this. this go no, it's none of that. He's simply saying, 
look, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And the people themselves were listening and saying, that's not what I'm experiencing. That's, what I, that's not what I'm seeing here. No, that, that's, that's not what's going on. Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is very different from the kingdom of this world. Very different. And that's really his main point because, see, he's right now just starting his ministry. He's just finished calling his disciples. And this is really his first big hurrah. He's just introducing the kingdom of heaven. And he wants them to see that it's different. But Jesus, being the master that he is, um, sometimes he can actually weave two main ideas into one story. So it's not only that one, but also the kingdom of heaven is all-encompassing. It goes down to our motives. Even our motives are in view when it comes to the kingdom of heaven. That's global thinking. That's the way much of the Bible is written, besides Paul. Take Paul out, you got a lot of, you got a lot of global thinking. And that's the way a lot of people that are coming into this area are thinking. That's the way a lot of people that we talk to, they're thinking. They keep coming back around because something is bothering them. And if we hear, we can understand what that is. We can hear that they're coming back to an event, to an idea, to a feeling, an emotion of some sort. And that's where the problem lies because they keep coming back to it. And that, for them, is the main idea. And if we can speak to that, then we can speak to their hearts. So the Bible is not all linear thinking. <laughs> the Bible is not all global thinking. It's a combination of the two. You'll see it both. And you know what? We're the same thing. We read books nice and linear. But we talk to friends, talk to other people. Sometimes it can get very global. How did we get onto that subject? <laughs> because it just spins around. So I think the main idea then of this whole, this whole thing is be on the lookout. Because I think if you're watching for global thought, the more you look for it, I think the more, that's the, the more you're going to find it. So thank you. Thank you.